Hello and welcome back to Sinews of War, where last time we made a number of conquests. First, we were able to take the new capital of the Ottoman Empire at Ankara, stealing a very rich province from them. And then, just to the north across the sea, Gaiden was able to force the Russians to surrender at Crimea, so suddenly the Black Sea very much under our control. Far away in South America, we also stole another territory from New Spain, actually taking all of South America's regions now. Then we faced a large naval battle off the coast of Portugal to destroy the Persians who were raiding our trade, and despite some close calls, we were able to defeat their fleet without any ships lost, so that was fantastic. In eastern India, the Mughals brought a theoretically superior army against Costa to try and stop him from besieging one of their towns, and things weren't going well. Their combination of elite lancer, cavalry, axemen and heavy swordsmen meant that when they charged in to engage our lines in melee, things started going sour quite quickly. I've come to two slightly contradictory realizations. First, that the late General Nassau, I will adhere to his final wishes by foregoing the title of Lord he was lumped with, was, in retrospect, a fine, fine thing for the West India Company. Second is the ever clearer truth that the military conquest of the Americas is not quite such the amazing thing we had thought, for even the King's lackey Voorhees does it without any particular uproar. Just an interesting point to consider, I thought, but not the purpose of this afternoon. We need to discuss a trend you will have all noticed. The constant arrival of agents from Amsterdam. All claim to be here at the behest of the Stadtholders, while in reality the basic investigation reveals them to be furnished by a number of quietly wealthy gentlemen with links to the King himself. More interesting is what they're doing, inspecting every inch of our company, sizing it up, reporting back, and no doubt bearing ground for some sort of power grab by the state. What plans exactly the monarch and his goons have, I'm still unsure. But I can report faithfully that the principle of our independence is sorely at risk. Our response must be as slow and subtle as their offensive, but equally deliberate. No more of our troops must be sent to Europe, that is certain, and no state troops may be permitted to bear arms in the Americas. Ultimately, we cannot guarantee this policy, for the King, on paper, has far more troops than we, especially with the groveller Grotius shoving the East India Company into those gilded pockets. But there are plenty in Europe who may be able to act as a kind of insurance, many who can exploit the continent's loss of taste for kings. I assume you have all heard of one Gerard Voss. So the lines of Costa's army struggling against the Mughal offensive, but I've managed to get a number of regiments out to form this bowl just outside the melee to provide some supporting fire and a bastion of stability among the army. Half of the artillery has been caught into the melee and lost, the other half still firing away, but their line of sight blocked on many of their targets, unfortunately. Now, suddenly things started to get a lot better when my cuirassiers somehow fought their way through the massive blob of enemies and actually started driving them away, many of them routing and coming back. But now that the enemy's formation is broken up a little bit, we can make more attacks with the lighter cavalry outside the company cab and start bringing down units, especially the archers. The line I had formed off to the side there is now dealing with an attack by camels. The enemy has lots of reinforcement units coming in, including those camels, more camels in the background. So there's another wave going to come in in a second. We've got troops ready for that though in our new line. And in the centre here, basically both sides appear to have been defeated. The enemy routed or annihilated all of our troops, but then the cuirassiers on their own actually beat back the rest of the enemy's army there. And now the engagement is more fragmented with our heavy cav fighting archers, which is superb. And in other places, Places, we've got our heavy cav fighting with the enemy's heavy cav like here and we saw at the start of the battle that ours are actually slightly higher in quality in a close melee so expecting to slowly defeat them while all the enemy's infantry are either being kited or annihilated by my company cav when, whenever they rout they're going to be very easily defeated and you've got these very small units of cuirassiers just about surviving who are able to jump between units rather than actually finishing them off to make sure that the enemy are always running always getting charged does mean that some of the enemy's archers are going to be firing at my cavalry but not a huge problem and me 
meanwhile, that line I formed up is able to repulse any counterattacks by units coming back from routing like that unit of cav just there. So our artillery are now in a nice position to actually start firing on the enemy again with the fight in front of them suddenly being cleared up like that. Some archers have moved up to fire at my line. I ordered the artillery to load canister shot and fire at them. Did a tiny amount of damage. We can't really see very much, but if you look very closely, it seems most of the shots are actually flying over the head of the enemy. They can't seem to aim low enough to actually make these hits, which is unfortunate. So those archers are going to get some kills on us. Now some of the enemy's traitor soldiers moved up, form our company soldiers, engaging alongside the enemy's reinforcements. I'm just reforming my line, ready for a line battle, while those archers who were harassing me are now going to face the wrath of all of my surviving cab. I have lost most of my cab, but the few scrappy surviving companies are doing amazing work and basically winning this battle for me right now by clearing up all of the enemy's uh, low melee skill infantry like their archers and trashy gun troops. So at the back, the enemy are forming up an new army with their reinforcements. It's a little bit bigger than mine, but has lots of low morale troops, so I'm not hugely scared of it. And I have the artillery advantage, so I can pound them as they come towards us. And once they get closer, we can shoot them down with our big line of line infantry. There we see one of the enemy's gun units falling back after being shot to death. Now archers and axemen coming up to join the fray. Now we actually know that archers do beat line infantry in a one-on-one -on -one ranged fight, I believe because of the difficulty settings and the AI getting bonuses to its accuracy, which makes archers actually really good. So we have to worry about them. And of course, we do need to worry about the enemy's axe troops here, who uh, we really need to repulse by breaking them around before they reach the line, but it did not work. The enemy are going to be able to reach melee range. I decided to actually counter charge here, ordering my men to close in and get a tiny charge off in the last second. It might just about have allowed me to apply a charge bonus and got a few extra kills as that melee started. Next door to them, all of my troops are going to be gunning away, both with enemy uh, musket units and with enemy bowmen, so we're going to have mixed effect. But here we're going to have a nice effect where we have six volleys firing at once as two units both do a three ranks of fire right next to each other into the same targets so the enemies in front of them are going to take an absolutely massive pounding from that fire going to take loads of losses and a huge morale shock it doesn't actually rout them it kills loads but they do not rout. they're actually going to join a melee with this unit over here so you can see the Axemen have disappeared while we were watching that. They actually lost the melee. I think their morale was just too low to actually fight in melee at this late stage of the battle. And now my men very courteously allow the enemy's archers into their ranks to shoot them in the face at literally point blank range. Not totally sure what's happening here. That should have triggered a melee, which would have been good for us. But unfortunately, we're now taking losses. Further along, an enemy archer unit absolutely decimating my line of infantry. And I realize at this stage that because we're just losing this ranged engagement, I need to actually put this all onto melee mode and just rush down the hill into the enemy. And at this stage, I was able to get my cavalry to rear attack all of these enemy units at the same time. So very, very quickly, we're actually going to dispatch them now. The enemy's morale not high enough to hold up against these attacks from both sides. And right after that, it was really just up to Costa to finish this battle off. He took some cuirasses over to finish off the enemy's artillery. And of course, they didn't stand much chance. The artillery crew actually did kill a few of the cuirasses because my men are so tired. They're losing even against terrible units at this stage. But fortunately, the battle is over then. It looks like both sides took about equal losses, which would wash out as a win for them, but actually that didn't take reinforcements into account, so we'll see the truth on the campaign map. With this uh, victory, we have secured all of Eastern India. Uh, what cost is too high for that? It is true that we are most spent, but that is the end of it for these men, I'm sure. The Mughals will formally surrender before we see any of their stinking troops again. And despite all this, I cannot help but think in moments of weakness that this victory is too sour a thing to be enjoyed. Uh, not that I take responsibility for the details of it, only that it seems the rows of company men we see lying before us, that they are all staring right at me behind their eyelids. Uh, they ask why it's not they who paid the price who get to see the victory that was bought. Uh, they ask so much of me. Only me. I think... I think I shall have to retire and find a Bible that remains intact. 
So here are the full results with us losing over 2,000. The enemy over 4,000 once all their reinforcements are taken into account. But still, a pretty bad result for us considering that's about two-thirds of our entire army being lost. We can have a look at the stats here and see that some of the cavalry units performing very well. A couple of the infantry doing very well also. But it was those infantry units that got engaged in melee that really let us down, losing massive amounts of troops and not really inflicting much damage there at all. Even the grenadiers having the same fate. So with that battle over, at least that's probably the last of the Mughal Empire's serious armies in the theatre. We don't know of any other full stacks. Now back at the Ukraine, it turns out that Russia has decided to besiege Kiev once again with a force that looks smaller than us, but because our force is actually damaged from all the battles it's fought, it may not have such a bad chance. So we're just going to leave that for now and come back to it later. First, we're going to advance with Vermis towards Riga. The plan I've been trying to get happening for a while is finally here. The enemy only have three units inside, two of them are militia, so we outnumber them, but they do have fortifications, meaning the balance bar ends up not being particularly far enough favor but again we're going to come back to that because I think we can sort that out. In South America, we're going to continue our advance against the new Spanish, really for no reason. There's no actual purpose to continuing the war with them. Only that I believe if I got peace with them, they would just betray me. So I'd end up having to leave all these troops here anyway. So if I'm going to have to have all these armies in the field, we might as well use them to advance against the enemy and just wipe out the need for them altogether by capturing everything. Also going to send a few troops up north here to try and take out these stragglers, because little groups of stragglers can ruin your economy by going around raiding everything. We will in order to resolve against them, but it doesn't destroy the army. So annoyingly, we're going to have to now chase that unit of pikemen all over South America to try and bring them down. A similarly annoying thing happened at sea when Calumbra brought the main fleet to take out one new Spanish ship, and the damage to his own fleet was massive. So as we go into port, we're going to learn it's going to cost us thousands to repair the damage done to the fleet, and now we're going to have to wait for that repair to be done before the fleet's ready to go on its intended mission of going to West Africa. Now back over in India, Costa is able to finish off the last survivors of the Mughals he just fought and capture the settlement, so that is good news. I started by saying I'll upgrade those roads, but immediately went back on that decision when I realized we're going to need all the money we can get for actually replenishing forces in this turn because we've taken so many losses recently. Now I also realized that a really good idea right now would be to get peace with the Maratha Confederacy. They don't own any territory that we need, so it'd be nice to just focus on the Mughals and not have any Maratha attackers. Not that we're actually fighting with them at all we haven't really seen anything from them because they're basically defeated but it would be nice to just have it completely off the table they want a peace treaty that favors themselves they don't consider themselves to be the underdog here they want me to give them technology and money in exchange for peace i end up offering a peace where no one gets anything and they agree to that and that's absolutely fine by me because we have all of their territory so it favors us they're also friendly with us right off the bat which suggests they're actually not going to betray the peace treaty for once which is fine news news. So now we can focus our armies on our main target, which is a Hindustan up here, controlled by the Mughal Empire, with a gigantic garrison. So we are going to need a big army to go and take it, but De Beers can arrange just such a thing. And nearby at sea, I wanted to find out what had happened to the Mughal fleet. It used to be blockading our trade, but now it's sitting in their own ports. It looked like they were damaged, so perhaps they didn't go back to repair. Not totally sure what they're doing, perhaps just hiding. Now I considered whether my fleet would be able to beat them if they actually decided to come come and fight me and thinking that maybe we will because we have fourth rates I'll go and blockade their port and just see if they try and break out of that blockade. Now in the Crimea I was thinking it would be nice if Gaiden could come out to try and help in the Ukraine against the constant Russian invasions because that would definitely turn it. The problem is that Crimea is technically the capital of the Crimean Khanate which means it has really really low public order while being occupied by another power. So we actually can't leave without it just rebelling and then we would lose the province. So pretty annoying, although it's not critical because we don't really need a guide and it would just be nice to have him here. Up at St. Petersburg, I was having a look around at the various Russian armies that are still constantly surrounding the region and I noticed that one unit of cavalry has very sneakily actually taken those docks without getting intercepted. The main force can just go and get rid of them, so obviously they were putting themselves in a lot of danger by doing that, but still, very sneaky of them. I also had an idea while looking at the docks. I realized I could use the one ship I've got sitting around to actually do some spying because they can see over land to the enemy's settlement and it reveals to us they've got over half a stack sitting up there so not particularly useful information but good to know that we're still under threat in the region so we don't accidentally leave or anything like that. 
Now back in Anatolia, I'm trying to repair up all of our armies here uh, between Voss and Cordland because they fought so many battles, we really need to get them up to full strength. But we just don't have the money, so really we're going to end up just sitting around and waiting on this front. I did decide to deploy the reserve army from Istanbul to destroy the now relatively small Ottoman force that was sitting on our border. Well, not our border anymore, actually in our territory, on the border of Istanbul. So we pushed them back. Still two stacks to deal with. We're actually going to wait, especially because here we can see the public order is really bad. So if I actually move an army out of Ankara, it might rebel as well. So we are going to have to have it locked down for at least this turn. Now we're going to jump back over to Riga, where I'm basically thinking this battle is easier than it looks, and that if I do it manually, we'll be able to very easily take the fort from the enemy's low-quality troops, especially because we have a gun which we can use to negate their fortification. So let's very quickly go and do this. Lord Uvate is scared of the Russians. He proved himself to be not entirely useless in the last battle, and now he doesn't want to spoil that good press by going out for another. Rest assured the king will be hearing of his right-hand man's lack of zeal. And it would be quite good if I could mention in the same letter of how we brave few captured all of Estonia with a few hundred men and a bit of actual courage. It will be clear which of the generals on this front has the nerve to win, even if one of them didn't sleep with half the royal family. The only thing to fear is the locals. They've spent so long in one empire that all reports suggest they'll be up in arms if we just shift them over to another. We'll have to show them what the Golden Dutch Empire has to offer. All I need to do as the battle starts is approach the enemy's fort with my guns from an angle that will stop them using any of the fort's artillery to fire back at me. And that basically means coming on towards one of the corners. The enemy facing off towards the north with their three units not going to be able to do anything as long as I stay out of their arcs of fire. I've dumped a few units right on the other side of the fort ready to sneakily climb up the walls once my main attack begins. So we'll see that a bit later. So the guns just draw up. We can get pretty close to their walls since they we can't actually fire at me to make sure we're nice and accurate. I wanted them to shoot at one of the flat stretches of wall to open up a breach, but this angle is a bit difficult to do actually, so we ended up just shooting at the little corner fortifications most of the time, which actually turned out to be somewhat useful, because after destroying them, a few of the enemy fell off the side, and that included their commanding officer, so that was pretty lucky. There was only about eight guys who actually died, and they managed to have the commanding officer among them, so that was a very useful for us, going to make it easy to rout the enemy once we get inside. So I am now going to continue trying to fire up and open a, a breach so we can actually go inside as the enemy abandon the walls effectively. Now on the other side of the fort, my men are going to start their climb whilst the enemy are distracted, resisting my main assault. You can see I've opened up the breach with the guns. I'm getting my infantry ready to go in. But actually, the enemy had a different idea about how this was going to go. They wanted to come out, so they sent one of their units outside of the fort, and this is a disastrous idea because now it has to engage with these two units. They're not in a proper line formation, but they're still going to get plenty of firepower on the enemy, who seem to have a mission. They're running in a column, looking like perhaps they're going to try and wheel around the corner of the fort and go and attack one of my other units around there but whatever their plan was not going to happen because they just route under fire and start running away conveniently for me routing away from the fortifications meaning my cavalry can hunt them down although you can see I'm giving them orders to go and destroy those infantry it's not really working they couldn't actually find them despite being right next to them so I had to manually tell them where to move to and on the way they bumped into the enemy's infantry and that was a way to get them started with chasing them down so now we are going to be able to stop that unit from coming back from routing, meaning only two enemy units to deal with. Now, meanwhile, my plan to climb up on the other side of the fort wasn't going very well. You can see most of the men I ordered to climb have actually just interpreted those orders to uh, go off and go on their own adventures. Many of them climbed, others didn't, unfortunately, and because the whole unit isn't up there, it means the unit will now behave very glitchily because it's trying to move, taking into account the fact that some of its men are actually still outside the fort. I tried giving them new movement orders on top of the wall to kind of refresh what they were doing. Unfortunately, this unit actually takes another strange interpretation. They try and go through the gates, which apparently are controlled by me somehow, but they don't open for my troops regardless, so those men are now just going and be stuck awkwardly in the door while I try and force my men to reconsider and come up the ropes to join the rest of their unit. 
Now the enemy decided to send one more squad outside of the breach to have a look at what was going on and the exact same thing happened to it that happened to the first squad that did that so perhaps they could have predicted that but the other enemy unit left inside actually turned around and looked like it was going to fire at my men on the walls. So they are going to be able to inflict a very low number of casualties by occasionally getting hit by doing this. I could fire back but my men are busy still glitching out and they won't fire until their whole unit has stopped moving and they can't do that because their guys are all stuck in the doorways and stuff. So basically not much was coming of that but once my infantry came in and stood on the capture point, the enemy routed especially because we can now fire into their flank and the battle was won fortunately. So we have captured the fort with very minimal losses, probably could have been even fewer losses if my troops had got their acts together. We lost 19 men, killing over a thousand of the enemy, so a pretty fantastic result from our perspective, regardless of those little annoying bits. So we've now captured Riga. I can't afford to repair any of the damage that's been done but uh, hopefully we can save up for that and I probably do need to leave Vermeers to just stay here and control public order right now. I noticed the place is actually quite Protestant already so that's quite useful for us. Normally we take places that are completely opposed to us religion wise. Now regarding the siege that Russia has put at Kiev, I moved up some reserve cavalry. Those cav had been recruited back there, I think back in the Polish wars, and I've just been sitting around. So now they're going to come and get involved. I didn't want to actually make an attack here, because I thought my replenishment might actually next turn give me more troops than I have now, so I might as well wait for that. I wasn't sure if replenishment actually happened while you were under siege, but I decided to find out. And as it turns out, it doesn't even matter either way, because the Russian army actually just broke the siege and ran off now that it saw that my reserve cavalry was on its way. So that was the end of that. And now Sweden has an outrageous offer for me. They want me to give them Finland, and in exchange they'll give me indefinite military access, which is effectively nothing for a nation that's on the corner of the map. There's no reason I'd ever go and move through their territory to go anywhere. So I'm going to teach them a little lesson by trying to offer them the exact same sort of thing back to them, just to see how they like it. I'm going to offer them indefinite military access, which is actually a lot more useful than them offering me is, but I want no Norway in exchange and they reject it so that's what it's like Sweden. Watch this then, another treaty from those Swedish pests eh? Let's see, my good lord Uwata, the magnificent side of blah 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 yes. To march through our lands is a pleasure that no man of God should deny himself. Magnificent views, clear cool water and the calm isolation that breeds high intellect among gentlemen such as yourself. As you'll imagine, the right to enjoy such a bounty is rather exclusive. Exclusivity is maintained through an entry fee that can only be considered by those of true class and achievement. To enjoy all our beautiful land has to offer, simply provide us with the payment specified below. Okay, where's that? Somewhere in the small print? There it is. One times Finland. What? What? At the start of the next turn, Costa is going to start moving west through India, having completed all of his operations over in the east with peace with the Maratha, meaning we don't need to go any further east. The question is whether he'll actually see any more action. For now, we need to focus on what's happening on the west side of India. We've got this small little Mughal army here in a settlement, and it's kind of distracting me. What I really want to do is go over Hindustan with the main force, but the fact that the Mughals still, still have various forces behind my lines is sort of annoying, because they might at any time go and strike one of the settlements I took recently. But I move up to get the siege started with the main force anyway. You can see it's full of archers and swordsmen, two units which our forces have fared poorly against in the past in certain circumstances. So questionable what's going to happen with that matchup. I'm going to leave the siege going for now because we may be able to go and reinforce once we've dealt with all these backline problems. So I'm going to use my reserve army to get another siege started to keep this Mughal army under control. At least it can't move out anymore. The balance of power is about even, and that's another case where it just kind of depends how the battle goes, which side would come out on top there. There's more Mughal forces down there to the southwest to worry about as well. The problem here is I really want to be moving all of these garrisons away from the towns I've taken. I just don't want the Mughals to be able to go and sneakily capture them because their built-in garrison is very small. Eventually, I moved out these forces from further east. These were forces that Costa had left behind when he had travelled east, and they were going to rejoin his army. But now, they can actually come over and help out with this little 
situation. I also basically decided in my head that, you know what, we can basically go in and attack this town right now if we just pour everything in. And then hopefully some of my forces can go back to my other town so that the Mughals can't sneakily take them. So we need to do this battle. We do have an advantage now that we've moved up some reinforcements. We're not going to do that right now, though. Here's the small force I'm worried about. See, basically nothing there, but enough to take one of these towns, potentially, all these unfortified places with no garrison. Now back on the Ottoman front, I'm still basically not doing anything with the two main forces. I need something to sit inside Anatolia to stop it rebelling, and I don't want to move Cordland out on his own, because it'd be much better to have both the main forces take on the Ottoman stacks one by one. One thing I realised I could do is take out this small Ottoman force over in the west ports there. They have a very high level general in that tiny force, so it'd be nice to take them out. So the reserve army, which was moving up, is going to take a slight detour to go and finish them off. We completely eradicate the army with uh, very minimal losses, meaning that high level general is off the table. It almost repaired the port there, but I realize I'm going to need the money for lots of other things, so we are not going to do that. And the army will now start moving east to come and join with the main forces in order to support. I'm going to spend some money repairing up Anatolia, which will allow me to move out sooner in terms of public order and we're also going to be putting money into replenishing both the armies here so they are at full strength as well. Now in America I've got another public order situation which has finally resolved itself. I had to leave this stack in Mexico in order to stop it from rebelling but now I've got a few militia and the resistance to invasion has dropped so I am able to move this stack out and that's going to make a big difference against New Spain because suddenly we can start pressuring them from the north. So first we're going to totally annihilate this mostly old school cannons army which was just sitting around there and I'm going to order those guys to continue on to kill the other small army we can see in um, the region of Mexico and the objective will be to push further south and take the northernmost of the two remaining New Spanish settlements. You can see New Spain have put their armies in between their two settlements which is the worst possible place because I'm going to have stacks coming at both of their settlements from either side and their current positioning of their forces means they can't stop either of them so we'll see if they move. Unfortunately there's no road going into Central America from South America meaning we have to make a very long walk through the jungle in order to get into their territory so that means there's going to be a very large delay on this move. I also need to hunt down that uh, annoying new Spanish force that was just hanging around here and unfortunately when we ought to resolve some of the men survive yet again so this pike regiment has been very tenacious but eventually we managed to defeat them and finally South America is totally secure and those forces can now start moving back to go do something useful. So with all that done we're jumping back into India where we are going to have to do this battle. Lots of archers and melee troops among the enemy's forces but we have lots of cavalry thanks to all those reinforcements and we're going to be coming at the enemy from various directions as you can see from the campaign map which should help out a little bit so nothing too difficult expected here we'll see that next time looking at the limited figures we have on government support can be misleading at a glance they indicate that the empire was slowly losing support among the common people however if taken at any given location support seemed to increase dramatically after around a year of occupation the downward trend was actually caused by the constant addition of new voters thanks to the military conquest in all theaters of the war the Dutch's simple promise to not change anything won the support of massive sections of the conservative populations who previously had been fighting against reforms growing out of the spread of the Enlightenment. Casting out the reforms gave a much-loved impression of stability to the Empire. Thanks for watching. We're going to try and get our hands on the final three victory provinces next time in Sinews of War.